God's man may get in sin, but he will not stay in sin. That is what distinguishes him from the world. Welcome to Through the Bible. And today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to 2 Samuel chapter 12, where the prophet Nathan confronts King David with his great sin. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through the entire Word of God. And if you're new on the Bible bus, I want to welcome you to our listening family that joins us in more than 120 languages and dialects around the world. Now, as you begin this journey, there are a few things that will be helpful for you to know. First, this five-year tour of the Bible alternates between the Old and New Testaments, teaching from every book and every chapter. And as I just mentioned, today we're in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. But it really doesn't matter where you start. Just hop aboard, and in five years, you'll make it through the whole Bible. And second, we provide Dr. McGee's notes and outlines to help you get the most out of each lesson. Download them at ttb.org forward slash notes or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to receive them before each new study begins. Third, if you'd like to listen on the go, then visit our website at ttb.org forward slash listen to view your many listening options from apps to podcasts, station listings, CD series, and more. Dr. McGee's studies are available in a format that works for you. TTB is also the place where you can go to catch up on messages maybe that you've missed or to direct friends as they can listen with you. And if you've listened to us for a while, did you know that you can read Dr. McGee's introduction to each book? You'll find the intro for our current study at ttb.org forward slash Samuel. Now let's pray so that we can begin our study in God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word that reveals your truth and help us to learn from David's life so that we can be people who glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, last time we were in the 11th chapter of Second Samuel. That is the record in detail of the awful sin of David. Bible does not play it down at all, and very candidly, this sin of David stands out like a blackberry in a bowl of cream and like a black sheep in a flock of sheep on a hillside. Now, the sin of David may cause us to miss the greatness of the man. The sin is the exception in his life. It was not the pattern of his life at all. David didn't live like this all the time. There are some that do. And when they do, why, they're not God's man. God's man can't live like this. He may get in sin, but he won't stay in sin. That is the thing that will characterize him. That is the thing that distinguishes between God's man and the man of the world. God's man may get in sin, he won't stay there. A sheep may fall in the mud, but he won't like it. He'll get out of the mud. A pig will stay right in the mud. Now, we have here this that we need to note, this sin. We're not going to play it down. Actually, I should say you can put a penny on your eye and blot out the sun. So let's be very fair as we look at it and look at it just as God's given it to it. And God has said, by the way, that men are like a piece of pottery. They can get marred. One flaw can ruin a valuable piece of pottery. A valuable article is put on sale, and the merchant says it has one flaw in it. And I notice that sometimes you see a sale in a store, and I'm great at, as I go about over the country. When I see a sale, I beat it down to the store. And I find that first-grade merchandise will become second-grade merchandise. And they'll say, now, this is marked down because there's a little flaw in it. And you're going to have to mark David down because of his sin. And I'm not going to play down the sin of David again today at all. Last time we saw it in all of its blackness and ugliness. The Word of God does not soft pedal it. The Word of God doesn't whitewash David at all. And we're not going to do that. His sin is as black as ink. It's as dark as night. It's as low as the underside of Satan in the bottomless pit. And it's as deep as hell. It's a sin, friend. Now, how could he be a man after God's own heart? Well, he wasn't a man after God's own heart in reference to this sin. I begin where I left off yesterday. 
in the 11th chapter, verse 27, the last sentence. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, don't forget to read that. This displeased God. And God's going to do something about it. And he'll do something about your sin and my sin. You see, God did something about man's sin. He gave Christ to die to pay the penalty because the sin is that heinous. It's God who says that sin is so black it required the death of his son. But if you turn your back on God, you're lost. But on the other side, if you're God's man and you drop into sin, God's going to do something about it. He'll do something about David. We left David last time sitting on his throne in smug complacency. He thought he got by with this sin, but he didn't. God's going to do something about it. David's going to live to regret that he ever committed this awful sin. Now, will you notice chapter 12, verse 1? And this is dramatic now. Let me tell you, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. This is, I think, one of the bravest men in Scripture, because David could have just lifted his hand hand and the scepter that was in his hand, not said a word, and they could have taken Nathan out and executed him for what he told David. And David's the kind of man that would execute him. We've already found that out, haven't we? Nathan's a brave man. Will you notice? But the Lord sent him. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Here's a little story that Nathan's going to tell David. A story where David can see himself in a mirror. And that's what the Word of God is. It's a mirror. It reveals us as we really are. And that's what Nathan's going to do, is hold up a mirror, the Word of God, to David and let him see himself. And I think that Nathan came in, God's prophet, and that probably a lull in state business. And David says to Nathan, do you have anything from the Lord for me? <laughs> and he does. Do you notice it? And here's the story. There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. That's a typical city, is it not? There's the ghettos, there's the slum, and out yonder's Beverly Hills, out yonder's where the rich live. This is the picture. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, that sounds very familiar. Verse 3, But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. And with his children it did eat of his own meat, drank of his own cup, lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. In other words, this little lamb was a pet, greatly loved by the family. And they fed it, and this was the pet of the family. And so all the poor man had. That rich man had flocks and herds. What a contrast we have here. This is the continual war between rich and poor. And very candidly, I think the great problem today is not a race problem. I think the great problem today is capital and labor, rich and poor. I believe that's always been the problem. And I don't think it's been racial. I think it narrows itself down to rich and poor today. Now, will you notice, Nathan is really telling a story here that's quite familiar, is it not? Now, will you notice, the poor man had nothing but the little ewe lamb. The rich man had everything. Verse 4, There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. He was not a generous man. He was a skin plan, as you can see. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now, let me say something to you. I do not digress or discuss politics on this program, as you can see. But I'd like to just put down what is a great principle in this world today of sin. I recognize that certain political parties say they have the solution to the problems of the world. They want to be elected to office. I have no confidence myself in man. I do not believe that any politician today is going to do the thing that will be for the good of the poor. 
I don't care who he is, what he said. He's not doing it for the good of the poor. Never has that been done. It's not being done today. Let's not kid ourselves about that. It's quite interesting. They talk about they need money for this poverty program. Who pays for it? Do they tax the rich? No. My taxes have gone up. I tell you, they're sure taking my little ewe lamb, friends. And that's the story. Oh, this is a real story, friends, that Nathan's telling. And it's a very up-to-date story, by the way. Now, will you notice this? We'll see David in this in a moment. And they took the poor man's lamb. He dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now, when David heard that, he was a typical politician right now. And David had a sense of right and wrong. He had a sense of justice. And down deep underneath, there was a faith that never failed. There was a love for God that was there, and it was warm and real. I'm reading verse 5. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. It's interesting. David knew that Nathan was not making up the story. He thought that he had brought this story in about somebody out in the kingdom, and he was asking for David to rule upon it. Well, David is this hot-headed, red-headed fellow I've been telling you about. Old David stood up now, held on to the arms there of the throne, and he says, where is that man? We'll arrest him. We'll execute him. It's interesting how you can see the sin and somebody else can't see it in your own life. And that was David's problem. Now listen to David. He's still talking. Verse 6, He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. My, David sounds like a preacher, doesn't he? So easy to preach to the other person and tell him his faults, tell him what he should do and to absolutely analyze him. Most of us are psychologists who put other people on our own little critical couch, and then we give them a working over. And that's David. David says, wherever that man is, I tell you, we're going to do something about it. Now look at this man, Nathan. Right here is where he's, the, to my judgment, the bravest man in the Bible. I know no one that can compare to him. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. <laughs> Thou art the man. May I say to you, he took courage to say that. He said, David, you've been found out. You are the one that's guilty. You are the one that did this. And you are the one that is as guilty as you can be. And now what's David going to do? Well, before we see what David's going to do, and he's going to do something that's unusual, I can assure you that. Dr. Margoliath has said this. He says, when has this been done before or since? Mary, Queen of Scots, would declare that she was above the law. Charles I would have thrown over Bathsheba. James II would have hired witnesses to swear away her character. Muhammad would have produced a revelation authorizing both crimes. Charles II would have publicly abrogated the Seventh Commandment, and Queen Elizabeth would have suspended Nathan. And the very interesting thing is the Duke of Windsor years ago would have given up a throne for her. And we've had some presidents that would have repealed the Ten Commandments and appointed Nathan to the Supreme Court. May I say to you, my friends, David didn't do any of these. Will you look now at what is going to happen? And now you'll begin to see the greatness of David. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house thy master's wives under thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. That is, God says, I'd have given you anything that your heart wanted if you would have asked me for it, and it would have been a right thing. Verse 9, 
Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? God said this was sin. After all, who said it was sin? It's God who said it. When somebody comes to me and says, Oh, how could God say that David's a man after his own heart when he committed such an awful sin? And I always like to say, Who told you it was such a great sin? It's God who said it was. It's God who made this a great sin. And today in the new morality, they're saying this is not sin. God still says this is sin. And God says the man after his own heart can't get by with it. David didn't get by with it, as we'll see. Listen to God now as he's speaking. Verse 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Don't you imagine, friends, that that court there that day was shocked? Because there were many of them standing there that day that didn't know. And now they're hearing Nathan accuse David of the most brutal crimes that are written in a book. The things that God says, thou shalt not, David has done them. Is he going to get by with it? Well, you notice verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Now may I say, Christian friend, when the question rises, can you commit sin as a Christian? And the answer is yes, you can. But when you do, you despise God. That's what you do. God says that. I didn't say it. And God says, I won't let you get by with it. You're my child. David's not going to get by with it. Listen to what God says. Here the sword will never depart from thy house. And because you took the wife Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And friends, in the next chapter, a scandal breaks out among the children of David, and it's an awful thing. Heartbreak to this man. You will never find him whimpering or crying out to God about it because David knew that God was putting a lash on his back. All David wanted is, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He says, I'll take thy wives before thine eyes, give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son, for thou didst it secretly, But I'll do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Now listen to David. Now David could have done many things, as we've said. Other rulers of the world would never have acted like David. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. David should have died, of course, for this. Howbeit, because by this deed... Thou hast given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that's born unto thee shall surely die. And friends, they still blaspheme God because of what David did. When I was pastoring downtown Los Angeles on many occasions, I had some vile person, unbeliever, skeptic come and say to me, how could God choose a man like David And they would leer at you, you know. God says you caused the enemy to blaspheme. Still blasphemes. God's going to take him to the woodshed. And Nathan departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. He would not, neither did he eat bread with him. He went before God and pled with God to spare the little fellow's life. And finally, why, they brought word to him that the child was dead. And verse 19, But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He's dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. 
And when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Now, all of them are astounded. He had been in sackcloth and ashes. Now the child is dead and he should mourn and he's not mourning at all. Listen to him in verse 22. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. You see, David knew the little one was saying. He said, I'll go to him someday. He could never come to me. A child dying in infancy goes to be with the Lord. Where it says in Scripture, it says their spirits or their angels are before my Father in heaven. Speaking of the little ones, the word angel should be spirit. And it means when a little one dies that he goes immediately to be with the Lord today. That is the teaching of the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but it means a great deal to me because i got a little one up there, and I'm looking forward someday to going and being with that little one, you know. David could rejoice now, but when Absalom later on dies, and that's another thing was a heartbreak to David, David wept and moaned. Why? Because he wasn't sure about Absalom, and he had a right to take that position. I'm not sure about him either, but I don't know. Verse 24, And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. And that means beloved of the Lord. And now we find David going back out to battle, and we find him in Joab, verse 26, fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon, and they took the royal city. David now is back out in the field where he should have been all along. Now the question is, David's kingdom continues to be extended and expanded, And David becomes a great, great ruler of that day. What about the sin? Did he get by with his sin? Well, the very next chapter, and we'll have to reserve that for next time, we find out that he had a son that committed an awful crime, that he raped his half-sister, a daughter of David, and Absalom, the full brother of the girl that was raped, he killed him, killed the other one say, that was a scandal. Can you imagine how that spread over Israel? They said, look at the king ruling over us, and he can't even rule his own household. Look at the awful thing that's taking place yonder in the palace. Poor David. Honestly, before we get through with the life of David, I feel like saying to the Lord, Lord, you whipped him enough. You put the lash on his back. Why don't you take it off? You whipped him enough. But, you know, David never said that. David went into the presence of God, and there's a psalm that goes with this chapter. I think you know which one it is. It's Psalm 51. David went in before God, and he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from thy sin. And then he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Bring me back, David says, into fellowship with you. That's the thing David wanted above everything on this earth. And David never whimpered or cried about this. David knew that this was that which was coming to him because of his sin. Oh, my friend today, a child of God just doesn't get by with it. That's all. Wasn't that connection to Psalm 51 wonderful? Despite David's great sin and his shortcomings, he had a deep love and respect for the Lord. As Dr. McGee hinted, more drama in David's family unfolds tomorrow as our study of Second Samuel continues here on Through the Bible. Need to reach us? Well, you can always find us online at ttb.org or just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. 
Well, I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.